पॉइंट्स एंड नेम्स रेकर्ड तो करते ही ना कि माइक्रोफोन इज हियर सो बट लिटिल विथ कशास so yeah here is the microphone see if you can hear can you hear me no by the way it says sharing paused when you shared in the system why sharing is paused why is you share is you is you okay then me koi acha
Is it okay? Just one sec, then let me see. Okay. Recording is happening. Yes, I think it's happening. Yeah. Uh, recording is happening. So. That's okay. to ask you, Jit. I don't know. I'm just checking this slides. Yeah. So the first eight are the hobby, huh? Show me. Okay. They could microphone to the cool. Now, I don't know. Can you hear me now? Yes, I think you can hear me. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, all, more than 50 years ago, okay, I was here as a student, and uh, I'm glad okay, to come back here as a speaker. Um, but today I have to, I mean, I must recall. Uh, uh, today I will be talking about some 50 years of experimental high energy physics. And in fact, okay, I came across this subject because uh, two of my colleagues at Cultivation of Science asked me to write about 50 years of, uh, uh, of experimental high energy physics. And that's why, okay, I when I prepared and when Shrutisan asked me to give a colloquium, I chose this subject. It's not nothing more related okay to that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I spent 50 years in experimental high energy physics, so that matches almost my experience on, on, on this subject okay, over the last 50 years. Now, let me start with essentially the, uh, in, uh, the story from Galileo. And Galileo made the statement that I attach more value to finding a fact, even about the slightest thing than a long reputation about the greatest questions that fail to lead to any truth whatsoever. Now, that means, okay, I mean, experiments are important and without experiments, okay, science cannot move. So this is really the beginning of modern scientific thinking. In earlier days, okay, I mean, there have been lots of philosophers who thought about what, how are we made of, what are the origins of human beings and what is the origin of the entire universe. But those are philosophies. And without any experimental verifications of those thoughts, we cannot really move, okay? So that was the thing of the modern science. Uh, so we just jump some several like, hundreds of years and go to the end of 1960s. Now, 1960s, they had, it ended with a lot of promises in the field of high energy physics. The first thing is that, you know, if I move that direction, I move this. No, no, I, it's okay. I, I, I do without the thing, okay? Uh, what happened in the end of 1960s, we had a, discovered a large number of hadrons, like protons, neutrons, pions, etc. This led to the idea that hadrons are not fundamental particles. So they have constituents, and they thought, okay, the constituents are named as quarks by one scientist named Murray Gilman. Gilman. Now, that was one, one end of the thing. The other thing is that there was an experiment which was done at SLAC where they tried to hit protons with high energy electron beams. And they found out there are uh, uh, some large angles scattering of that. It is like a Rutherford experiment, but done at the level of protons. And that means, okay, the protons has got point-like constituents and Feynman essentially tried to explain that away and gave the name partons. So we have quarks on one hand and partons on another hand. And these are the two things okay, which we which had okay, at the, uh, in the early 60s and mid 60s. Uh, at the same time, uh, the theoreticians have really looked at the theories of weak interaction and electromagnetic interaction and they found out those two interactions are very, very similar. 
So there was an idea okay, to have an unified theories of electroweak interactions. But there are several such models okay, which try to unify electromagnetic interaction and weak interaction, and they had some experimental consequences to really say, okay, what is right and what is wrong. Then the, <laughs> there are many symmetries, okay, which, which are there, okay, like the translation symmetry, rotational symmetry, and things like that. Some of the symmetries are found to be exact, but some of the theories symmetries are found not to be exact. They are violated by a very small amount. So this is some, another thing which was found. And finally, okay, we had got quarks and leptons, which were found in two generations. Like, okay, I mean, the quarks, you have got three, three quarks, up, down, and strange, where up and down in one generation and strange in a second generation. And for the leptons, you have got electrons, muons, and the two types of neutrinos, and they form two different generations. Electrons and one type of neutrino is one generation, muon and another type of neutrino is in a second generation. So all these things were there, okay, I mean, so the, we have to move forward. And how to move forward? We have to do new experiments to move forward. So that was the things when we start the things in 70s. Now, how, how we can move forward? To move forward, we need, uh, technology has to advance. Uh, to, so for example, okay, we have to increase the energy scale, at the beginning, okay, I mean, in the 60s or even earlier, okay, I mean, when you're trying to do experiments, we have already built up accelerators by Lawrence in the, uh, in the 40s. And the, all these accelerators were giving beams of particles, and these particles were hitting a fixed target, like a, a piece of liquid hydrogen or, uh, uh, or some metals, but the in a total set, energy available from a fixed target experiment is not very large. So if we are, want to increase energies, okay, the one direction was to find out, okay, was to collide two particles in opposite direction to gain the energy. So we have to move to uh, electron positron storage ring was started in the 60s as an experimental basis in Italy. And in CERN, they had a proton-proton storage ring called intersection storage ring which started at CERN. Now, to, uh, we are looking also for rare and rarer events. So if you want to look for rare and rare events, we have to move away from visual detection techniques to something okay, which is electron detection techniques. So that means okay, we have to enlarge the statistics by a large amount and to really see a picture and try to identify things from a picture is very, very cumbersome. So you have to do something through, uh, record the things on a, uh, uh, some sort of a storage device and try to analyze that using computers. That became a must. Uh, the, then at the same time, when you try to move away from a visual detection technique, obviously you have to know that whatever you are trying to deduce okay, from the uh, non-visual technique is correct. And then you have to uh, have things like a simulation and uh, utilization of uh, visualization to, to do that. Uh, then the other thing is that we have to produce intense beams of particles for devising new focusing uh, techniques and obviously all these things okay are required and there are many steps which are being done and these two gentlemen are pioneers in this thing this this gentleman is uh, Simon van der Meer uh, he was an accelerator renowned accelerator physicist and he devised uh, and he in fact invented many many things okay which moved the energy physics forward and this gentleman is George Charpak who really made a revolution in the detection technique. And he made also, again, a okay, I mean, large number of things. And both these gentlemen who come and receive Nobel Prize at some point in time. Uh, so let us move to a physics topic in the first place. And the first place was looking at the unification of electromagnetic and weak interaction. So 
in the 60s, there have been many models which could unify electromagnetic and weak interactions, but each model required okay, something extra, which was not yet seen. There was a model due to the two most prominent models are, are these two. One model is due to Georgia and Glashow, and they, in fact, required a heavy charge leptons. And the other model is due to Weinberg and Salam. They wanted a neutral vector bosons. Now, the structures were on for both these particles. Now, for the first one, the heavy charge lepton, a good place to look for heavy leptons was in electron positron colliders. And a good place to look for neutral vector bosons, which are coupled to the weak interactions, was an experiment with neutrino beams. In fact, these two gentlemen, okay, I mean, first suggested to have neutrino beams. He is Bruno Pontecarvo and he is Melvin Schwartz. Uh, he was originally from Italy, but he sometime in, uh, in the early 50s, he defected to Soviet Union because of his idea of communism. So he was, he may be the first guy who uh, do that. And Melvin Schwartz was in USA. Okay, I mean, he really moved the US laboratories to make the experiments with, at the BNL using neutrino beams. And that experiment, okay, I mean, showed two types of neutrinos. That means, okay, I mean, the neutrinos which are associated with muons are one type, the neutrinos which are associated with electrons are of a different type. And that was proven by an experiment done in 1962. Now, at the same time, not at the same time, an intense neutrino beam could be produced using the technique of magnetic horn, which is discovered by Simon van der Meer at CERN. So this is the movement in one direction. Now, to, for detection, uh, in the 60s, uh, they, they made a 1.2 meters long heavy liquid bubble chamber by a guy called Colin Ram. And this was constructed at CERN, and this was exposed to neutrino beams. Uh, the, the, at that time, the neutrino beam was not intense enough, and also the chamber was not really that big. So there are very few events were observed uh, to provide evidence of anything new. Okay? I mean, that was uh, a really a disappointed, disappointment to come in at that time. And there was a conference in 1963 at Siena uh, where they expected to see neutral current but did not see anything. So, but they demonstrated that this is the right technology for future experiments. Uh, there was a guy who came in who was uh, present in the conference. His name is Andre Lagaric, is this gentleman over here. He conceived a very large uh, second generation uh, bubble chamber, uh, which was to be filled with heavy liquid, right, free on. So he conceived that right at the Siena conference in 63. This was installed, it was built and installed at CERN in 1970, and the first run. This is the, this is the uh, chamber when it was installed. This is surrounded by a magnet to provide the magnetic field so that the part, charge particles going through that okay, will have a bent uh, trajectory. And from the uh, bending of the trajectory, one can get the momentum of the particle. Now, not only he uh, proposed this chamber, he also made a European collaboration of these seven laboratories. And this was one of the first big uh, what you call a collaboration which took place. It consists of something like about 50 to 60 people, uh, which, is, which is considered a small collaboration in Hany piece of today. But, but at that time, it was considered a large collaboration. And if you ask me, okay, when I did my first PhD experiment, how many people were involved in that particular experiment? There were 12. So it was definitely a large collaboration. 50 or 60 is, is a large collaboration. Now, what happened is that the, the, when the muon interacts with the uh, nucleus of the, uh, uh, in the bubble chamber, it will uh, normally will produce a muon because the neutrino, when it goes to a muon, okay, that is an exchange of charge. It's called a uh, charge current event. And if it is a, there's no muons, okay, neutrino remains as neons, neutrinos, that is called a, that would be a evidence for a neutral current. 
So here, for example, the neutrinos comes over here, and this is a picture from this Gargamel. And what you see, okay, I mean, you have got three particles which are coming out, and all three particles are interact or decays. So all these three particles are, cannot be muons, they are hadrons of some sort. So this is a clear uh, event, okay, a candidate okay, for a neutral current event. But it's not. Is this a bubble chamber? This is a bubble chamber experiment. Gargamel is a bubble chamber, and this is a bubble chamber experiment. Now, what happens is that, okay, I mean, it's not just neutrinos okay, which are in the beam line. They're, when they produce the neutrinos, okay, how, how the neutrinos are produced in a beam? You, you essentially start with a beams of protons that is accelerated in an accelerator. This proton hits some nucleus target, and it gives rise to other charged particles like pions and kaons. And if you, pions and kaons, I mean, though they are semi-stable, but if you give them sufficient time, they decays. And pions and kaons will give rise to, uh, when they decay, okay, they give rise to uh, neutrinos of the muon type. They, because pions and kaons decays to a muon and neutrinos. So if you can get rid of the charged particles, whatever left, left over with it would be essentially, will be the neutrinos. And those neutrinos are fed into this thing. Now, the only thing is that uh, it is not the neutrinos which come in the beam line. It also, you have got neutrons in the, in, in the beam line itself. So how can you say, okay, these are not due to neutrinos, it is due to neutrons. The only thing which you have is that neutrons have a large cross-section, neutrinos have a small cross-section. So that I'm, so, so what happens is that uh, if you look at where the new interaction takes place and try to plot that, you'll see that the, new, the neutrons will interact in the very forward part and then it will, uh, in the back of the uh, chamber, there will be very few. Whereas I mean, if you have a uh, neutrinos, neutrinos, uh, the same distribution will, will be almost flat. So they try to me uh, measure the positions of the neutron stars and simulate the primary vertex distribution of neutron in this background. And they found out, okay, they have a lot of excesses to cover uh, neutron stars uh, for, for these stars who come in uh, at a large uh, distance okay, from the uh, beginning of this chamber. So, so I think they try to look at the, the muon uh, uh, muon events and the muon less events, and then looked at the uh, distributions of the primary vertex and in neutrino beams and anti neutrino beams. And they found out, okay, I mean, as a function of the distance, okay, they're, they're more or less constant, okay, I mean, there's a, and uh, what they saw is also the lateral displays, lateral positions, also their constants. So that really says, okay, I mean, it is a New, neutrin, uh, muon less neutrino interactions which is taking place, which could be due to the neutral current. But the clinching evidence came from anti neutrino beam experiment when it scatters of atomic electron. So here is a case okay, where the uh, candidate or coming was found to be a, uh, this is a neutrino, uh, this is a neutrino direction, this is it comes in here, and you have got an electron which comes out. And this electron okay, comes out okay, from an electron, and that uh, neutrinos, anti neutrino beam gives, giving rise to an electron can only be due to a uh, neutral current. So these are the two evidences which came out okay, to, for evidence of neutral current. But there were other experiments. We do not really believe okay, in something okay, from only one experiment. There were other experiments. For example, this gentleman, his name is Carlo Rubia. He was doing an experiment at Formula. And it was a very, it was a very high energy neutrino, neutrino beam, which was there, and this was a uh, Harvard, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin formula collaboration. And they claimed observation and then non-observation of the neutral current events. So it became a story of alternating current. So you see some time, you don't see some time, okay? So that, that's what's the thing. And this led to the idea of alternating currents and the Gargamel ex experiment never received its due recognition. 
Uh, but there's always luck that HPWF also got its reward as well. In the 1974 Rochester Conference in London, Carl showed evidence of daimion events without claiming it as the first observation of Chiang Kuo. So he also did not really get the recognition that he has observed Chiang, evidence of Chiang Kuo for the first time. So he removed the, uh, what do you call the, what Andre Lagerix uh, claim, but at the same time, okay, he also did not uh, got the claim for the discoverer of Chiang Kuo. So that discoverer <laughs> came from two experiments, in 1974, uh, which is called almost like call it, uh, 70, October 74 revolution. And the two experiments at Brookhaven Laboratory and SLAC came up with the observation of a very narrow state with the mass of 3.1 GeV. Now this is a, a resonance. And we have seen many resonances in high energy physics in the 60s. But what is speciality of this uh, thing? It is at a mass of 3.1 GeV where the particle can decay to number of uh, pions and kaons and things like that. It decays, but it has a very narrow width. That means it has a large lifetime. So that, uh, that it means, okay, the probability of its decay is, is very small. Uh, so this gentleman, King, he did an experiment at Brookhaven with a proton beam coming and hitting a thin target. And he had a double arm spectrometer. That means, okay, I mean, here in the main magnet, okay, I mean, the particles are this, uh, uh, what do you call, they bent in a duration depending on the boom, uh, charge. Some bend in the, this duration, some will bend in the other duration. And he has a way to uh, say, uh, identify electrons and also measure this momentum. So from the measurements of the two momenta, you can reconstruct the mass and found a very narrow peak at 3.1 GeV. So he's a very careful experimenter. So he tried to see that it is not an artifact of, uh, uh, of the apparatus and things like that. So he did many, many tests. Okay, I mean, he, he, once he found it, okay, I mean, he spent more than a year okay, to say that this is the correct thing. And the peak always remains the same. Now, this particular experiment had a dozen of people okay, who are his collaborators. It is not a large collaboration in 1974. Uh, at the same time, there was a, uh, uh, an, a group of people who was led by uh, this gentleman, Bach Richter, uh, was measuring the cross section in a plus and minus uh, collision in, at SLAC. This collider is uh, called sphere. And again, okay, I mean, when they try to do an energy scan uh, of that, they found a broad bump around 3.2 GeV, and they took up an very finer scan around the mass region, which reveals very narrow resonance structure at 3.1 GeV, right at the same place. Now, the explanation, I mean, there were many explanations at the time, okay, I mean, in 1974, but the one which stood out is uh, the same explanation which gave rise to a so-called narrow width of the phi meson. Phi meson was discovered, okay, in the 60s, and phi meson was found to decay to pair of kaons. Now the mass of the phi meson is just above the mass of the two kaons. So it is uh, the phase space which is available to it for to decay to uh, the two kaons is very small and that's why the phi meson uh, is narrow. So they said, okay, this, this particular resonance must be consist of two, 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 two types of two quarks. And uh, here, okay, I mean, for example, k meson uh, has a, uh, one strange quark with a, another up or down quark. So the, the corresponding thing for the, uh, the new quark and uh, consisting of mesons the, will, will have masses larger than the uh, half of the mass of this newly observed state. So they could explain this thing. And so this is the evidence of the charm quark. So whenever you have discovered that, you have to really look for where are the charm hadrons, okay? Where you have got a charm quark and a non-charm quark forming a hadron. Uh, there are many searches which are on okay, at that time, but again, the same experiment which uh, found out, okay, the JSI, 
uh, was uh, the, uh, the same experiment discovered the D mesons. Okay, what they have found out, okay, that uh, they looked at the uh, pi plus minus k minus plus mass distribution with a, some sort of weighted distribution and they found a clear peak here. And this is the uh, thing that came from the uh, discovery paper. And this particular thing is found out to come in to be the, uh, the D, D meson. Now, the, the thing is, okay, I mean, uh, you see, ICL is imperial for London, okay? We also tried to look for this anti-proton-proton -proton collisions in CERN, but we did not find, okay, that this thing, okay? But we had... Yes, this was my second experiment. So there was a big program using silicon detectors and high resolution bubble chambers later on at CERN and at Fermilab. We studied properties of charmed hadrons during the 80s. Now, then comes the, the next unwanted particle. Uh, I think when people observe the muons in the 50s, okay, I mean, in, not the 50s, in the 40s, said, okay, uh, I think Pauli made, made this statement. Who, who has ordered these muons? Okay, I mean, because it is something which people nearly really didn't want. The same thing happened, okay, I mean, uh, when they tried to look for a third left, child left on, okay, I mean, because we had, after the discovery of Trump, we had got uh, four quarks, and four leptons. That really fulfills the thing, okay? So we do not need, okay, anything more than that. But uh, people really were looking for uh, something new. So uh, the discoverers, in discoverers' world, the discovery came because of the three things, okay? The three developments which were developed. There was a connection between the electron and the muon. So that was the first thing. The development of electron positron storage ring and the development of the theory of sequential electrons. These three ideas together will come and give birth to this thing. Now, uh, the, the person who really discovered his name is Martin Pearl. Okay, again, okay, he is a Nobel laureate. But uh, uh, the thing is, I mean, it was not he only okay, who started this thing. Uh, in Italy, okay, I mean, the first electron positron collider was made in Italy, okay, and in Adone. And this scientist really started looking for events with electrons and muons of the charges. Unfortunately, okay, I mean, the energy of Adone was not high enough. So experiments done at, done at Adone could not find evidence of any exotic events. In a, and in a series of papers, they provided only the lower limits of any new sequential electron. The first put a limit at 800 MeV, and then at about 1.1 GeV. Now, Spear, okay, I mean, they went up the energy to about 3.8 GeV, and the search of this uh, EMU events were on. So this is Ma Martin Pearl, of, of course, not at the time of discovery. He's much later than the time of discovery. And he was scanning, okay, for events, okay, which could be a candidate of electrons and muons. This is a muon candidate okay, where the muon track does not interact within the detector and it goes away, okay, far, far away from the detector. This is the, their muon chamber. So this is a evidence of a muon. And this particular track, okay, which is uh, of opposite charge, uh, you can see the, the bending is opposite direction. And this one deposits all its energy in the element decalorimeter and so it's a candidate of the uh, of electron. So uh, he quoted, the signature of EMU events cannot be explained either by the production and decay of any presently known particles or it's coming from any of well understood interactions which can conventionally lead to an electron and a muon in the final state. So, so we have got something new. So this event inter observation was followed by observations in other electron hadron and muon hadron events, uh, not only at sphere but also in in Hamburg in the Doris ring. And the energy dependence of the cross section, uh, which, which is shown here, uh, shows the threshold effect. Here, I think you have started producing high up and then it starts falling again. This particular type of measurement tries to use to the measurement of the tau lepton mass, and that's how the mass is determined. 
Uh, this is a little bit complicated thing. Uh, so during the late 60s, okay, I mean, you have got deep inelastic scattering of electrons and protons that demonstrated uh, that the cross section depends only on some dimensionless quantity and not on the energy scale. This effect was termed by a gentleman called uh, Bjorken as a scaling property. And this leads the idea of patterns as point like constituents later on by uh, Feynman. Now, with the advent of high energy neutrino beams in SPS, several experiments were proposed to in the West area, the so called West area experiment, to study the goodness of the scaling hypothesis. So, this is the, where the protons are extracted, this is where they are led to decay. And after that, okay, when they come over here, this is the, a, a big experimental hall. It's called the Omega Experiment Hall. But it passes through that, and then there are four experiments aligned one after the other okay, to study that. The first one is called BEPS. The second one called, it is a collaboration between CERN, Dortmund, Heidelberg, and Sackley. It's called CDHS. Then you have Gargamel, and finally there's an experiment called CHARM. Now, two of these experiments, BEPS and CDHS, proved at the structure function in nuclear target. Uh, this is Jack Steinberger, who was the leader of the CDHS experiment. And this gentleman, I think you might have read his book. His name is Don Parkins. He was at Oxford Laboratory, UK, and he was uh, essentially one of the key persons in the BEPS, BEPS experiment. BEPS is again a bubble chamber. This is the last one of the last bubble chambers which is built. And this is one of the big bubble chambers, the big, uh, 3.7 meters in diameter. And it has a huge one. And if somebody goes to CERN, it will, you can still see the bubble chamber in the exhibit area. Both BIPs and Gargamel are there in the exhibit area at CERN. So this is the way okay, it was there. It was equipped with uh, not just the bubble chamber, which filled up with the uh, neon hydrogen mixture, but also it has got uh, other detectors so to detect the neons which when it comes out, okay, it's called uh, external muon identifiers. CDH experiment consists, uh, I mean, it has got a huge uh, experiment. It has got essentially iron interleaved with the uh, plastic scintillators. Now what they observed is, uh, found out the structure functions over a large range of energy transfer they, they measured and they demonstrated a clear violence of scaling. And also the scaling has a logarithmic dependence. And this was the first quantitative evidence of quantum chromodynamics, which is the theory of strong interaction. So this is where, where they plotted one moment against another moment okay, in a log log plot. And they found out, okay, this, all these things are dependent on a, on a logarithmic scale. So this is uh, the first evidence of QCD. Now, once the SI is discovered at BNL and Spear, I mean, that people said, okay, we cannot stop here. And meanwhile, okay, I mean, in 75, okay, they have a, a third lepton, the tau lepton, which is observed. So why not try to look for another type of uh, quark? So the idea was the same. You have a fixed target experiment, and then you have a double arm spectrometer and try to measure the uh, the leptons with a, the best possible accuracy. But here, instead of looking up electrons, they're trying to look up, uh, use the muons. And this gentleman is the leader of this experiment. He's Leo Lederman. And uh, he was the, uh, essentially leader of this Columbia Fermi Lab Stony Book collaboration, okay, which uh, tries to look for this. Again, okay, I mean, the, uh, now, uh, the muon momentum resolution was not as good as the electron energy resolution, which was observed in the BNL experiment, but uh, so they could not clearly see a sharp peak. And what they saw is that they have a, uh, saw a large enhancement over here. And the background expectation here, if you can really see, okay, the background expectation about somewhere around 350 and they observed 770 events, okay? So it was a uh, several sigma away. 
if you're from background. And so they said, okay, it's either a single state or two states of masses, but uh, they have to wait okay, for electron positron experiments done at a uh, Dory century, okay, I mean, to find out, okay, in fact, there are four states. First three, okay, are very narrow, and the fourth one is rather broad. <laughs> This is absolute thing. Like, what was the discovery here? Uh, this is a, like uh, JSI. Uh, they found a pair of uh, charm quark. Yeah. This is the the fifth type of quark which was seen is called beauty or bottom. Yeah. And upsilon is the a bound state of B and anti B. Oh, B bar. It's a BB bar. <clears throat> so again, you can see the whole thing hinged on the width of the thing. The width is about kV, and the mass is at the level of GV. Okay, so this is six orders of magnitude between the the mass and the width. So it is again a bound state of the thing, and uh, it has got the open beauty uh, mesons have a masses of above uh, half the epsilon mass. So this was seen okay, later on okay, by a CLIO experiment at CESAR. Okay, they, they showed okay, the evidence of this thing. Uh, so these are the experiments, all these experiments are in the 70s. So you can see, okay, when I was young, okay, I saw lots of exc ex excitements okay, in, in the 70s. Then came the 80s. And this is the thing okay, that, uh, uh, during the mid 70s, okay, two big proton synchrotrons started operating, one at uh, CERN, where the energy went up to 450 GeV, and the one at Fermilab, it started, initially started at 400 GeV, and then it had a so-called energy doublet to go, go to 800 GeV, and before going finally at a one TV, so it's called, that's why the name Tevatron comes from. Now, the weak vector bosons are expected at mass around 100 GeV. Now, if you hit a proton beam with a fixed, uh, fixed target, you can never produce a okay, I mean, uh, 100 GV object. The total center of mass energy okay, cannot give rise to the uh, cross of 100 GV. So these three gentlemen, Rubia, uh, David Klein, and Peter McIntyre, they proposed to use either SPS or formula rings to have a beam of antiprotons which are accelerated and collided with protons in the opposite direction. Now, where do you get prot antiprotons? Now, protons is very easy. You just ionize hydrogen gas and you can have a good source of protons. But to get antiprotons, there is no natural sources. So you have to get these antiprotons from the collision of proton beams on a nuclear target. But when you get, do that, you get a very hot Antiprotons. That means, okay, I mean, they go in all directions. They'll have a large momentum spectrum. So they, this hot gas of antiprotons has to be cooled down somehow. And there are several, uh, there are two methods which were proposed at the time: one at uh, Russia and Novosibirsk, and the one at uh, CERN by this gentleman again, Simon van der Meer, which who has given rise to the so-called uh, stochastic cooling of antiprotons. So. Doing that, okay, I mean, they get an antiproton beam. Okay, Sun gave the first antiproton proton collider. And at that time, two experiments were proposed to look at this antiproton proton collision. Uh, Rubia laid the first one, it's called EA1. And this is the picture of that experiment. This is a large, uh, uh, hermetic, uh, this is a large magnetic spectrometer with a hermetic calorimeter to measure electron energy and missing transverse energy with very good accuracy. The other experiment was try to utilize, okay, the, some sort of a complementary thing. Uh, I again forgotten the name of this. I, I, I always confuse the, his name with Vilela, okay, but he's, he's not Vilela, okay, I mean, I'll tell you later on. 
this experiment was a complementary to the to the Euron experiment. That means it, it was not having a magnetic spectrometer, and all it relied on okay, I mean, to have a good calorimeter to measure the energies of the electrons and uh, measure of also the missing transistor energy, but no charge things. So both U1 and U2 observed events with high trans transverse energy electrons balanced by large missing transverse energy. And this was the evidence of observation of W bosons of mass around 80, 80 GeV. Not, this is a plot of this uh, scattered plot uh, of electron transverse energy in one direction and missing transverse energy in another direction. And you can see a big correlation between the two. That means, okay, you something almost produced at rest and it decays to uh, electrons and, and neutrinos. Uh, at the same time, okay, they also observed uh, two electrons of opposite charge, with this electron positron pair and they are balancing the momentum, uh, uh, transverse momentum equally. And that also gave rise to the evidence of the uh, Z bosons. And though it was uh, neutral current was discovered earlier, but uh, Z bosons was not seen that you, you saw only the virtual evidence of uh, Z bosons and this is the real evidence of Z bosons. Uh, during the 70s, you come in the sun also uh, came up with a proposal of a large ring to be used as a collider of electrons and positrons. And this large ring is something like about 27 kilometers in circumference and is about 50 to 100 meters uh, under, underground. And uh, electrons and positrons are moving in opposite direction, okay, and then collide at uh, several points. Okay, there may be up to eight possible points of collision. Now, CERN approved four experiments, each having its own specialty. This is Aleph, this is Delphi. These two have the largest uh, what do you call them? superconducting solenoids as a uh, charge measuring device. Then we have uh, this particular detector, Delphi, also has the capability of measuring the, uh, identifying the pions from kaons okay, using a, a special technique. Uh, then we have L3, uh, where I, I participated in this experiment. This has got, got a crystal calorimeter uh, so that you can measure the electron energies, electrons and photon energies to a very uh, high accuracy. And also a open air uh, muon detectors so that muon momentum can also be measured with a very high degree of accuracy. And finally, opal. And this was the most conventional detector and since all these three experiment, uh, detectors have got, uh, tries to stress the technology to some direction, they have some conservative detector, okay, so that if all these three fails, okay, this one will win. And, but nothing failed. So what happened in the finding at LEP? The first thing it found is that okay, they tried to measure the cross-section as a function of energy. And this energy is, determined with a very high degree of accuracy. Okay, so that was the lab group really measured that uh, accuracy in a few parts in million. So the mass measurement to come in of the energy, uh, mass, uh, central mass en uh, energy measurement is so accurate. So if you can look at the cross section as a function of energy, you can see a beautiful peak and you can fit that peak, okay, with uh, either with a two neutrinos will be like this, three neutrinos fit here, and four neutrinos are like this. So you can clearly say, okay, there are only three light neutrino species, and not neither two or not four. Not only that, okay, they measured many uh, electrobic uh, measurements, okay, with a, with a very high degree of accuracy, and this thing led to the idea that. Uh, the bare calculation of uh, any quantity, any electric quantity is not enough. And you have to uh, go through by, uh, if you know Feynman diagram, you have to go through uh, the so-called loop diagrams. And those things are called uh, radiative corrections. And this radiative correction was proposed by 
two gentlemen called Feldman and Tuft. And this was a thing okay, which really measured the radiative correction with the significance of five, five sigma. So after the LEP experiments, these two gentlemen okay, got Nobel Prize, not the experiment. The, uh, the other thing is that okay, in electron positron collision, we get also uh, hadrons, which are multi hadrons, which are produced. But these hadrons, uh, are electron positron collision, you essentially give rise to electron positron giving rise to pair of quarks. And these quarks okay, will, will not be uh, manifest them as particles, but they will form hadrons to, uh, to be seen in the detector. Now, Feynman and Field okay, gave the idea of jet formation. That means uh, along the direction of the original quark, most of the particles we produce with a uh, very narrow uh, direction, like here. And in fact, the SPR experiment, okay, I mean, they looked at this uh, electron positron collider uh, with this multi-hydronic finite state, and they really saw that uh, essentially there have been uh, two direction, two uh, uh, jets going back to back. Not this this thing. Okay, this was this came much later. So that was uh, evidence. Okay, that jets are really there. Now, uh, in Hamburg, okay, I mean they have this. Uh, uh, there was a Petra uh, electron positron collider, and there they had five experiments: Pluto, Tasso, Malgrie, Ted, and Cello. Now Pluto and Cello they shared the same experimental site, okay, whereas the Tasso, Malti, and J. Luca is three. And one of the things they saw is that it's not just two jets which are there, okay, sometimes you get even three. Obviously, okay, the third, the two jets were much more dominant, but they thought you also get uh, three jets in the thing. And these two gentlemen, okay, <laughs> the gentleman and lady, okay, this is Saula Nu, and this is Bjorn Bik from the Tasso experiment, okay, I mean, they really gave the first evidence uh, of a third jet. And the third jet is due to uh, Bremsstrahler, like a, when an electron, okay, when it bends in a thing, okay, it, it Bremsstrahlers to give a photon. Similarly, false also Bremsstrahlers, okay, to give rise to a gluon. And so that means, okay, when I mean, you have got the gluons, which is also a requirement of the uh, QCD. And the study revealed it has got also a spin one like W and Z. Uh, Let provided a precise measurement of the strong coupling constant. And so if you measure the coupling constant over a large energy region, uh, you find out okay, that, that coupling constant decreases as a function of energy. And this is an evidence of asymptotic freedom, which is also a key feature of QCD. And that thing also gave uh, some theoreticians the Nobel Prize. Yes. <coughs> but this. Check and, check and they got the Nobel Prize in 2004 for the discovery of acid. Yes. But this was the experiment that. Made. This is the experiment. This is the experiment which was done in the. Uh, from 1990s to 2000. <coughs> so this was clearly demonstrated in the experiments okay, up to 2000. Okay, to, so that the Nobel Committee could give the Nobel Prize in 2004. Uh, now, uh, the, the thing is that, okay, we have got one lepton and one quark for a third generation. But it, there was evidence that the quark is, uh, cannot be only one, it has got a partner. Uh, so that people started looking for the partner okay, for, of, the, of the beauty quark, starting from Petra. Tristan and Lepp, and we got no evidence of the elusive talk quark. Uh, and the only thing, the uh, precision electric results favor a mass range between 145 GeV to 185 GeV for this quark. But uh, one has to wait till the two collider experiments started operating at the Tevatron collider. Uh, and like EV1 and EV2, okay, I mean, this CDF experiment and the D0 experiment uh, have complementary 
detectors. This CDF experiment is like a U1, uses a magnetic spectrometer with a very sophisticated tracking detector, complemented with a calorimeter, which is not as good as uh, D0. D0 has one of the best calorimeters so far built, and also muon detector system. D0 has a muon detector system, but also uh, it has got a central tracker, but no, almost no magnetic field at the initial age, but one of the best uh, calorimeters of that time. So, so the hunt for the top work was on, and CDF was the first guy okay, to, to take a look. Now, top work supposed to decay okay, to a bottom work and, uh, and maybe the lepton. So, they looked at uh, uh, B quarks and leptons and how they can study the B quark. B quark has a lifetime motor which is small. So you can try to identify those B quarks by having a secondary vertex close by or by uh, semi leptonic decays uh, through that of the, of the B quark. So in both these cases, they found out okay, excess of events and compared to the background. And from that, okay, I mean, they said, okay, there is evidence uh, at the level of uh, nearly five sigma by the, uh, for the top part. And when they looked at the masses, the, what the mass they found out, okay, some, somewhere around 176 uh, within uh, statistical and systematic uncertainties of about 10 GeV. Uh, so that is for the uh, CDF. D0 were unlucky, okay, not to have a good uh, spectrometer, but they're having a very clever basis in the team. So they try to invent, okay, some uh, observables by which they can try to separate out, okay, I mean, a heavy, heavy object from a standard background. And they invented something is called uh, some of the scalar, uh, scalar sum of the transverse energies which is called HT. And you can see, okay, the signal and back, the background is this, uh, uh, what do you call this black dash line? And the solid line is signal. And you can clearly see, okay, they're separate. And they also try to think about uh, some sort of an artificial, uh, what do you call it? Intelligence in, in these things. And this may be, okay, the, uh, the first, in, uh, deployment of the artificial intelligence are uh, in, in searches. And they saw 4.6 sigma observation. And, but the estimated mass was not very good. Okay, they did not have a good mass measurement and you can see, okay, they have a too high uh, mass measurement. Yes, sir, what do you mean is plus minus 20 and plus minus 20? Is it one is systematic and the other is statistical or no? 20 is statistical and 22 is systematic. Right. Yeah, the always the first error. Uh, uncertainty is statistical and second uncertainty is uh, as is already. Now, the next one, which, which is uh, really something which is uh, so far is not in the standard model, is an experiment which was done starting from the 60s. This gentleman is Raymond Davis. This performed an experiment at the Homestake Mines uh, to measure the flux of neutrinos coming from the sun. He utilized a tank filled with uh, uh, 100,000 gallons of uh, parchlorofluoroethylene. And uh, what it's supposed to do is that the neutrinos will interact with this chlorine, <coughs> giving rise to an isotope of argon. Now this isotope of argon is a radioactive, but has a fairly large lifetime. So the, the, the bubble, uh, this argon, okay, to collect those argons, and then they let the argon isotopes decay, and from those decays, okay, they measure the flux of neutrinos. And from the very beginning, okay, I mean, uh, when I was a, Grad student who come in, I, I heard about that the measure rate showed a deficit, deficit with respect to the estimate from the standard solar model. 
but nobody really fully believed these things. You can see, okay, I mean, this experiment was done from, uh, you can see, okay, from uh, 1970 to 1994. Is that the thing? Because Amitabh actually believed he gave it off and said that people also did not believe him because they thought, oh, he's a chemist. That's why he must have made all these errors. So these are the arrogant physicists. Is that, is that true? Because I think ERC told us that that was one of the reasons. Look, I, I think uh, there was a very, diff very small difference between it. Physicist and chemist, okay, in, in days. Do you, do you think Rutherford is a chemist? <laughs> yes, he said that this was so arrogant people. They said, oh, oh we no, chemist, we chemist. No, I, I think it's, yeah. it's not the determination flux, okay, of, of course, it has a large uncertainty. And you can see, okay, I mean, they're trying to really see very small number of, yeah. uh, of uh, uh, isotopes. At the same time, people did not believe the Standard sol uh, solar model. That was done by physicists. Yes. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, okay, I mean, there was a huge, uh, what do you call it, excitement during the late 70s and early 80s, and there were pr proposals by uh, many well known. Theoreticians that proton is supposed to be decaying. So there's a large number of experiments which are performed for to study proton decays. But this gentleman, Oshima, he tried to uh, have a uh, proton decay experiment, but he was smart enough. <laughs> Sorry, I took too, too long. No, 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 it's fine, please. <laughs> so, so, Hoshiba used a water chain cup detector. That means, okay, when some, something, uh, when protons will decay, okay, I mean, it gives rise to electrons and neutrinos, okay, and the electrons will rise to give rise to chain of light, and you will try to detect that. But OPST proton was found not to decay, and so we are still alive. And, uh, but whereas the same experiment okay, could really look at neutrinos coming from anywhere and can interact with the, uh, uh, either the nucleus or, or the uh, atomic electrons and give rise to, again, sharing of lights from the electrons which is going through. And it will be a neutrino detector uh, of, uh, of some of great importance. Now, apart from neutrinos coming from the sun, neutrinos also come from the cosmic rays. The cosmic rays interact with the Earth's atmosphere and produce pions and kaons, which decays on the path uh, to the Earth. And this can give rise to flux of neutrinos crossing mostly uh, neutrinos of muon type and some neutrinos of electron types. Now, this uh, detector first of all observed, there is observed also the neutron flux. Uh, uh, I mean, there's a deficit in the neutrino flux as compared to the measured muon flux. So there's a deficit of uh, solar neutrinos, which are essentially solar neutrinos are consist of neutrinos of electron type. And also there's a deficit of uh, atmospheric neutrinos, which are muons of the uh, neutrinos of the muon type. So you have got deficits, but deficits can be due to many, many things. So, and all these things will come in, uh, can be for a number of uh, possibilities. Uh, and both the experiments, which were I described uh, before, utilize the charge kind of interaction of neutrinos. Now, at Sadbury uh, Observatory, they had a heavy water Cherenkov detector and they measured the solar neutrinos uh, 
from the uh, flux from the boronate decays, and they utilize both charge current and neutral current processes in the nucleus. So they could look at the flux of all neutrinos, not just the uh, new, new is. They also had, if there's a new mu come in all types of neutrinos, okay, they could be rise to. Now, what they found out uh, that uh, the total neutrino flux really matches with the uh, estimate okay, from the standard solar model. So that means, okay, I mean, the total number of neutrinos are the same, but if you really want to say, okay, the number of electron neutrinos, they are not the same, okay, I mean, they, so the electron neutrinos, okay, might have changed from your neutrinos on its path to, to the, coming to the R. So this really established the, the so-called oscillation hypothesis of the uh, neutrinos, and that means, okay, the neutrinos have got some mass. So finally, okay, I come to the, this century, okay, I mean, all these things were in the previous century. Uh, in this century, we have one particle of standard model which is still missing, uh, which is Higgs boson. Now, all precision electric measurements are, I mean, this is a, some sort of a chi square plot. And if one look at the pi square as a function of the Higgs mass, you can see that uh, the bottom of the thing is around 90 GeV. And if you can really see, okay, I mean, it's up to three, uh, three standard deviation, okay, so you can see, okay, I mean, it should be less than some, somewhere around 171 GeV. So one expects, okay, if Higgs goes on, okay, if this standard model is true, to be lighter than 170 GeV. Now, let experiments really looked for the Higgs boson and could not find any Higgs boson in the standard model framework. And they eliminated Higgs boson below 114 GeV. <coughs> At the same time, okay, Trevatron also ruled out Higgs bosons in this, in this region over here. So Higgs boson is restricted uh, between, I mean, some, so, some, somewhere between 114 to 156 GB. And if one believes in this 171 GB, okay, it's only 114 to 156 GB. So this was one of the biggest motivation for constructing the Large Hadron Collider in finding the Higgs boson if it exists. So there are two experiments which were, uh, look, we went to look for this. Uh, now, both the experiments are clever, okay? They did not try to have a non-magnetic detector. So they both the experiments have a uh, magnetic detector. This is ATLAS and CMS. This one uses a toroidal magnet and this one uses a, a solenoidal magnet. Both has its own advantage and disadvantage. Uh, so, so I think, okay, I mean, the, and here the number of people who participate in these experiments are not in tens or hundreds, okay? They are in thousands. And, but they are looking for really, really rare, rare processes. And now the Higgs bosons can decay to any fermions and directly, or it can decay also to photons, not directly, but through some, some sort of a loop diagram. So Higgs decaying to a pair of photons uh, has a very tiny cross section. Higgs decaying to pair of W's and Z's okay, have large branching ratios, but uh, the W's and Z's dominantly decays hadronically, but if you try to measure them through the leptonic decay, then you don't have that, the overall branching ratio is very small again. Now, why are you talking about these two? Uh, the detectors are very good in measuring the momenta and energies of the photons, electrons, and muons. And with that, okay, I mean, you can reconstruct the mass of uh, the combined system with a very high degree of accuracy so that the signal to background would be uh, very good. Whether uh, if you look for higher uh, branching ratio objects like a BB bar or pair of Ws, okay, I mean, it would be, uh, you have got a large cross section, but you have also a large background. So they look for these subjects in the pair of photons or pair of, uh, not pair, okay, two pairs of, uh, of leptons. 
And you can see, okay, I mean, you have got excesses here and excess here. And those places, okay, I mean, are the same mass around 125 GeV. And when they do a statistical analysis of this, they found out, okay, that in the statistical analysis, there are more than five sigma away. So this was uh, subsequently uh, substantiated with other decay modes of this 125.3 GV. Okay, we are seeing in the decays of pair of Ws, we are seeing in pair of Vs, we are seeing also coupling to the uh, top quark. Uh, obviously, it cannot decay to pair of top quark because the top mass is heavier than uh, the Higgs mass, but it can couple to the top, top mass. We have seen, we have seen uh, also the Higgs decaying to pair of mu's, muons. But angular distribution uh, suggested the spin parity of this object to be a scalar boson. So over the last 50 years, uh, we saw several ex excitements, but the important thing is that discovery did not come all at once. They came one after the other in a sequence of abundances, real processes came later in time. In fact, the sequence helped us to under, understand the underlying phenomena better. If all of them came at the same time, okay, we'd be at a loss of okay, how to integrate things. So we had understood something. So we used those understanding okay, to go to the next step and so on and so forth. Uh, I think almost all the observations which I mentioned here led to Nobel Prizes, either to experiments or to the theoreticians who predict such observations. Now, I live through this exciting period involved in some of these path-breaking experiments, but there are still many uns unanswered questions. Of course, they are all from theoretical prejudices, otherwise, who can ask questions? But prejudices lead to new knowledge. So the journey has not ended now, and it will continue to define the truth. Thanks. Questions? Questions from the audience? Yes, Do you need a microphone? No, no, no. So, uh, we said that the last bubble chamber was made at some point. After that, all the, so currently, all these detectors, what is the underlying process there? There is some sort of a uh, charged particles will go and what is the underlying process in all these detectors? There are several processes, okay. I think I gave the name of the person, okay, who, uh, George Charpa, who made this, what we call the multiwire proportional chamber. Okay. And the main idea is that when charged particle goes through any gas, uh, I think uh, it ionizes the gas. And when the ionization is formed, okay, if you have an electric field there, uh, both electrons and the ions will, will drift and you collect those electrons and the ions okay, and, and from that signal is amplified and you can see okay, the, uh, the, the particles are uh, there. Now, multiwire proportion chamber means okay, if you put 100 wires in parallel, there are 100 detectors. They're all independent. And that is the main thing is that okay, when you're in a compact area, you can have uh, many detection systems. So this is one thing. Uh, one also use semiconductor devices. Uh, for example, when it goes to, to silicon, such particle goes to silicon, you have got iron uh, hole pairs, electron hole pairs, and they again, okay, I mean, they, they, those can be collected, okay, and then they can give rise to signals. So from they also give rise to another type of detectors. Uh, similarly, there are uh, when uh, some materials, when the particles go through, uh, it excites the electrons, and th those excited electrons can produce uh, what you call a scintillation light. This is called scintillators. That is another type of detectors which are used. So there are many types of detectors which are used, okay, which, are, which can give very fast signals, signals in at the time of about a nanosecond or, uh, or even faster than that. So we, 
So we not only want signals, we want signals which is very, very fast so that we can record in interactions, for example, at a very high speed. Any other questions? Okay, yes, yes. So, uh, so I understand that uh, you need very uh, high energy B to get uh, to whatever small particle you want to do. What is the major challenge in increasing this energy? Uh, well, I, I think the main idea of high energy beam is that uh, if you want to go to high energy beam is required because we are really going to have uh, we are looking for objects of very high masses. That is the main, main reason of going to high energy. Yeah, that is, what is and, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, now the main challenge obviously is uh, limited by how much electricity you can consume. You going to uh, going to high, higher, higher and higher energy. Uh, how you, you can energize charge particles? You apply electric field to energize charge particles. You can apply the electric field repeatedly. That means you come and you have, and uh, slowly you can build up the energy of these charge particles. And ultimately, okay, the thing is that, okay, I mean, how much RF power you can have. And when you try to uh, have the repeated repetition of the applying the electric field, you try to confine the trajectory in some sort of a confined path. A confined path means it's a either a circle or some mixture of circle and straight line. Uh, but there, okay, obviously, okay, I mean, you have to bend those charged particles applying magnetic field. So you, have, you need a very high magnetic field for doing that. Uh, so far, I mean, the largest energy we have got in this large hadron collider. There are proposals okay, for going even further. So uh, there are experimental magnets which are made, uh, which is uh, have a bending for twice as much. That means we are right now we are using a nine Tesla magnet. It will, we have it can go up to sixteen Tesla or eighteen Tesla magnet. So this is one thing, okay, where it can go. That if you move away, okay, from uh, the standard way of applying electric field, okay, to other direction, okay, I mean, there have been uh, some other technologies which was seen, okay, like pl using plasmas or some subplasma, which I do not know anything about, okay, I have no idea about what, what it is. But they are really at the level of experimental stage. Uh, the only thing which is in the production stage is our old technology of applying electric field, applying magnetic field, and then you have as high electric field as possible, as high magnetic field as possible. And whenever you use that, you have to see that uh, you do not lose power otherwise. That means, okay, thermal loss is zero. If you have thermal loss is zero, the only way you have is superconducting. <coughs> Any other questions? Any other questions? If not, I actually have I actually had three questions, but let me ask the first one. So I think for one is related to what Shomodi Bas is asked. Is that uh, so? <clears throat> so the heat smog is around 125 GeV, and we saw that the top quirk that's the heaviest particle in the standard model. That's like 178. 176. 176 GeV. So that's more massive, but it took much. So much later, we could, uh, you know, I think we could uh, find out the Higgs particle. So what was the reason that we had discovery of the top work? Yet it took maybe maybe fifteen, more than fifteen years, I would say. Yeah, 1995 was. Uh, yeah, 20 years almost. Close 1995 and 2012. 2012. So yeah, 17 years to discover the Higgs. So what was the catch there? Why was top work? discovered uh, before because mass scales are even higher for the top quark. So yeah, you have to realize, okay, I mean, uh, one thing is that top quark is, belongs to a quark family. Yes. Uh, and quark family, you can always get through strong interaction. Yes. 
uh, Higgs obviously, okay, I mean, comes through electromagnetic, and if you produce Higgs, uh, you have to look how, what is the cross section of the pro, uh, Higgs production. So Higgs production cross section is much smaller compared, is it three orders of magnitude smaller than the top, top quark mass production. So even if you put in enough energy, you come in and, but being that, you come in, uh, in a hadron hadron collision, you come in, it is a, it's a much rarer events. And you have a, a total cross section in a proton proton collision is at a level of milliburn. And the Higgs production cross section is at the level of femtoburn. So, so I think, okay, when you have a milliburn against a femtoburn, or 100 milliburn against a femtoburn cross section, okay, you have to really, uh, some, you have to dig out something from. So that means so the, the rarity is, is the main challenge. main challenge. Okay, but then how was that overcome? I mean, by making a bigger collider or what? Is the how did you overcome that? I mean, why couldn't we do it like 15 years back? Um, 15 years ago, okay, I mean, if we try to do that, we can, if we, the, I mean, maybe in, 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 For example, in Tevatron, okay, I mean, they, uh, the, cross, the signal to background was, the background to signal was much, much higher. And the total luminosity which was provided in Tevatron is smaller than the luminosity uh, which is available in NAC. So these two things, so okay, I mean, how much, uh, how many events you can produce, so okay, I mean, that itself okay, was a positive thing. And the ratio of the cross-section to, the uh, production cross-section to the total cross-section was much more favorable at uh, LAC than in Tevatron. Okay. Any other questions? If not, the microphone. Yes, please. Is there any reason the flux of neutrinos and the solar neutrinos that are see is constant or what the If so, then you were talking about two experiments. So, one experiment just had a deficit of neutrinos, and on the other experiment, I think there was another experiment where you said that the number was kind of the disturbance was made. So if those if there is a difference in the flux uh, of between you know, two points and if the experiments are conducted on different uh, places, then uh, how do you how do you conclude that uh, yes, there is a difference? Well I, I think the distance of the sun and earth is the main main thing. Okay, I mean coming anything coming from so far away uh, will have Almost the same flux everywhere. We talk about seasonal variation, like sun rays have different amount of color and put on the company. It doesn't really average over the season. But otherwise, there is no reason. If you think of the solid angle, when two points are not, it is much, much, much smaller compared to the distance from the arc to the sun. That's the answer. Yes. Uh, and the thing is, okay, I mean, People have studied the seasonal variation of the flux, and that was one of the things which were studied in, in particular in Davis experiment for a long, long period of time. And that, they, there, are, there are many models that came uh, from that. You see, he looked for from 1970 to 1994, 24 years, all those variations that he took care of. Very, very diligent. Any other question? Yes, Shami and then Shami. So, uh, uh, I have a question that are we looking for supersymmetry in our experiments? Well, <laughs> the thing is, I mean, uh, any theoretical model has to have predictions of some sort. Uh, now, supersymmetry is not a single, only one prediction. It has thousand different predictions of, of there. And uh, so depending on 
a model in supersymmetry, there are certain observables which we look for. Uh, now, one of the common things, okay, I mean, one type of supersymmetric models suggest, okay, I mean, anything which is, uh, uh, when the supersymmetric particle is produced, it will decay to the lowest mass of that supersymmetric object. And obviously that, that thing will not be detected in the detector, will leave like neutrinos leave. So we have got large missing energy in that. So large transverse energy, large missing transverse energy is a key measurement okay, for looking for this type of supersymmetric objects. Now, not all supersymmetric models do not have this picture. They have okay, I mean, something okay, which can even decay okay, at time uh, to standard particles without leaping to a lowest mass supersymmetric object. But they also come up with some other features through which we can make observations. Does that answer your question, Sir, uh, what are the current research that is going on in this field? And what is the scope for us if we want to go It's a wonderful question. I think I also. Uh, okay. Uh, the thing is, I mean, that. There are two things. Okay, I mean, one thing is that what are really missing uh, in in the in the field of high energy physics right now. Uh, we have many prejudices in high energy physics. One is the uh, one is called lepton universality. That means all types of leptons are coming are behave more or less in the same way. But there are evidences right now, okay, I mean, which says, okay, that uh, electrons and muons and taus, okay, I mean, they are not have the same coupling constants. So this is a breakdown of the lepton universality, which is observed in some experiments, but at the level of four standard deviation, not at the level of five standard deviation. So this is, if, this is one feature which has to be explored, and that will definitely break down, okay, the standard model. Uh, then there are, again, pre, pre, I mean, all are, all are prejudices, okay? I mean, I would say, okay, I mean, they're, they're not, uh, uh, there are evidences of so-called dark matter. And the only evidence of dark matter are through gravitational interaction. But they, these things should also be featured in experimental particle physics, there should be the, there should be evidence for some in, interaction by which you, these dark matters are formed. That means, okay, it does not interact in the, exactly the same way as the standard matter, it interacts in a different way. So those experiments are on, and so far there is nothing has been found. So, so those things are still there. So these are the things, in, I would say, there are many others, okay? For example, many things to do with the neutrino oscillations, for example, are many, Things are unanswered okay, for, for, for that thing. And your friend has already said, okay, looking for supersymmetry or extra dimension. So there are things are okay, coming which, which one can look for. Uh, which are all of this I'm saying, okay, coming from theoretical prejudices. For example, when uh, we constructed Large Hadron Collider, it, we, we, it was built with a uh, theoretical prejudice that. Higgs boson exists or it doesn't really exist. If it exists, okay, standard model can be true. If it does not exist, standard model is not true. So, so I think okay, it was justified on the basis of some theoretical prejudice for, for doing things. But when, for example, tau lepton was discovered, or this, I mean, there was no prejudice at all. Why we should look for, a, uh, for another type of lepton? There was no, it was purely experimental prejudice or why uh, neutrinos have masses. So coming, for example, this neutrino oscillation experiment, it's not driven by any prejudice. It was purely experimental discovery. Even though there, some models were there, okay, which said, okay, Chum Park should be there, but the way it was seen was totally uh, uncalled for. So, so some experiments previously were done, 
only on an experimental uh, purpose. But uh, since these days have come in, experiments are too expensive. Without good theoretical prejudices, no experiment can be performed. Uh, so this is a, a, a broad picture, but I come to what are there okay, for time, uh, which is in the real horizon right now. The Large Hadron Collider has run for uh, essentially for six years with uh, some breaks in between. Okay, so that, that makes something about 12 years or 14 years. But it ran for six years. But it will run again okay, for three years, starting a few months, a uh, few days back. It will start running okay, for the third time. And it will double the statistics, which is currently here. And we have got few observations, which are at the level of three sigmas, uh, deviations from standard model. So if we, with double the statistics, we can increase these sigmas. We can see breakdown of standard model, even with this, the next three years running. Uh, then the, after this three years running, it will stop for a couple of years and it will run for another, how many years? 10 years. Uh, and that will be the, essentially the theoretical idea which drives that thing is to measure the Higgs self-coupling. And that is a impo very important feature. Okay, I mean, we, without measuring Higgs self-coupling, we cannot say, okay, this is standard model Higgs. This, this is a standard model like, that model like Higgs, but this is not a standard model Higgs unless we measure this Higgs self-coupling. So that will go up to 1940. Then there are proposals beyond that okay, to have a further increase in energy or having a different type of colliders. Uh, so how old are you? 21. 21. Uh, 21. So I think uh, for the next 40 years, there are plans okay, for high energy, experimental high energy physics. So you'll be 60 by that time. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, RC. So, uh, you know, when we want to find uh, more and more massive particles, we have we need more and more higher energy experiments. And that has been done over the years and new particles have been found. Is it possible that at the low energy end, because of uh, the possibility of producing so much noise that we can miss some very low energy particles. Uh, yeah, I, I think precision experiments always have got uh, uh, its own place. Because even if you do not observe uh, new particles of high energy, but higher energy particles also have effects on low energy observations. Uh, <laughs> For example, I'm saying, okay, when uh, the recent experiment which is done at Fermilab on the G minus two measurement of, uh, I think the anomalous magnetic moment of the muons, it has observed a uh, large deviation okay, from standard model, but it's not yet a five sigma yet. So, so it, it has its own place, okay. And similarly, okay, I mean, uh, muon to electron transition, there are experiments on okay, for me on to electron transitions with a high high degree of precisions. So so those experiments are still going on. So there are many places okay, I mean, these are really open up a new horizons okay for high energy physics. Any other questions? Yes, Arsi. Uh, I just have a technical question. So in one of the slides you mentioned quad born Bremsstrahler. Can you go to the slide here? Yeah. What brings on here? What brings yeah. what, What's that? I mean, in the jet physics slide, I think. Yeah. yeah. Because, <clears throat> yeah, brimstone is something that's very close to my heart because we see them in galaxy clusters and x ray emissions. No, no, they are essentially, you have got a quark coupling to glue on, right? Yes. So you essentially emit a high, uh, I mean, these gluons are usually emitted with a very small angle and very 
for linear one. Yes. Time to time, okay, you have uh, gluon emission at large ions. Okay. And those are the things that we just call for for green solvent to gluon. Oh, so it is so it is the it is the emission of gluons. I see. So it's not electromagnetic. No, it's not electromagnetic. I see. Okay. It is a strong interaction. No, no, it is, it is a strong interaction. Ah, wow. Great. Uh, any other questions? The matter one, just final question. If there are any other questions, I can ask that. Any other questions? If not, as long as we always we have been hearing this about the mass hierarchy problem in standard models. So what's the status of that? Do we understand it well or? Is it still like why is the mass of the I don't know of the top quark 176? Yeah, you have you have got mass hierarchy in the quark sector. You have got mass hierarchy in the nuclear sector, sector, yeah, sector. sector. Yeah. So any 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 clue like anybody thinking like in what direction can we have this? You should ask Partha about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you know in in cosmology there's something called inflation. And then there is because then so there was like maybe 10 to the minus 20 seconds after the Big Bang, you have this exponential expansion of the universe driven by scalar field. There is something called preheating theory. So where essentially in this inflaton field actually uh, decays to standard model particles. And so in those situations also this mass hierarchy issue comes that how come what is the coupling? I mean preheating also is not like well understood. It's just a Thing. But anyway, I think there aren't any questions. Let's thank Professor Banerjee. You should have asked him, not asked him.